So, um, what I, uh, how I wanted to talk to you about science and life in science was uh, basically to uh, try to answer your questions, not one by one, but more like in bulk. Um, I organized it really nicely, see, in uh, sessions. <laughs> Um, and I'll try to answer as many as possible. Uh, so uh, let's get started with the, uh, I don't know, first I want to show you how uh, my place works because somebody asked me um, how is my day as a research associate in the lab. So I come to work, this is where I sit and this is my view, see, and my flowers. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, the flowers, I have a, a, a little, very short story about them. Um, when we locked down, uh, some people back basically never uh, came back to the lab. They just retired and they left their flower pots. And I was looking at them throughout the summer and they were really not doing that great. So I asked them if I can just kind of adopt them. So I adopted them and I brought them to life. So that's why I have so many flower pots here, but it really makes me very happy. I come in the morning, I flower the pots and then uh, answer emails. That's the first thing I do. Although maybe I shouldn't, but um, uh, try to find my technician and uh, we talk about what was done uh, in the previous day what needs to be done. We look um, at the uh, results. Occasionally I do experiments by myself, not as much anymore. Uh, but when I was younger, I was doing experiments every day. And um, some of them were just um, experiments that I realize that they have to do immediately. And some are long-term experiments that need a lot of planning. And this is my bench, right? It's actually rather long. It uh, should be, oh, this is my technician. <laughs> um, um, and uh, this is where we do uh, work that does not require any special equipment in terms of, I don't know, microscopes, uh, PCR machines, and so on and so forth. For these, we have separate rooms where we keep them because they are kind of expensive and not, uh, uh, I mean, they are not like uh, uh, single-use uh, machine because they are super expensive, right? And um, when I was talking to your teacher, Tracy, the other day, uh, she really wanted me to show you how the lab looks like. And I tried to do that uh, in person. Uh, I did a test run and the Wi-Fi is not good enough. Um, so, what I would like to do is to show you the movie that I made a while ago uh, of the lab. Uh, and it was for my son's class. And while the movie is running, I will uh, talk about each part of the lab. Let me just see how I do that. I share screen, right? Uh, yes, I made you co-host. Okay, share screen, share desktop, and okay, I need you guys to tell me if you can see this. Yes. Excellent. It's also very loud. Let me see if I can kind of, okay, so this is, you get out of the elevator and this is um, in front of the lab. Um, you have to forgive me, this was the kiddie movie, so, you know, like I thought that that might be interesting for them to see the plants. Uh, it was 2013, we had a lab meeting that day. He, um, one person usually presents a really big body of uh, research about once a year. So this is what we called a PCR room. That's where the, we do genotyping of our mice to see if they are a proper genotype, these are the shakers where we grow bacteria. And they work 24 hours. They are really funny. 
um, and uh, they, the bacteria needs to be shaken because of the oxygen and temperature. So this is the lab, uh, one part of the lab with refrigerators and benches. Each person have one bench and uh, a desk, which is usually close to it. This is my part of the lab. You can see the same view. And it was early in the morning, so there were no people, but by the, the amount of crap on the de desks and lab space benches, you can see that it was really very busy at that time. Liquid nitrogen, we use that to freeze cells, tissues, keep temperature super cool, low. This is tissue culture room. Um, and hoods because it needs to be everything in tissue culture needs to be sterile. Um, you work in the hoods and then you keep the um, cells in these incubators at a certain temperature and CO2 and O2 levels. Um, cryostat, uh, this is the station where we do radioactivity. We don't do that anymore, not as much as we used to. Um, it's not necessary and it's very burdensome type of um, filing reports and stuff to actually be able to work with radioactive um, radioactive things. One of the offices, um, this is a chemical hood, hood um, where we use with, uh, that we use with uh, really smelly and uh, dangerous um, reagents, uh, glass washing area where we um, wash the um, dishes that we use, copy area. This is where we actually sit and uh, use these common computers, although each one of us has its own. Ha, this is a copy of a Nobel Prize. <laughs> And to be honest with you, I never really understood uh, what it says here, but um, at least people who got the Nobel Prize together with uh, Paul Greengard. Um, and this is the office. Uh, we used to have a lot of people who worked in the office, business manager and uh, two secretaries, not anymore. Uh, kitchen obviously very important for coffee. This is where we have our meetings, um, lab meetings, and um, we can also eat lunch there and uh, or we can have one on one meetings when we need to discuss science. And uh, oh, I have to admit somebody. I, I, okay. I did it. You're good to go. Um, view on the other side of the building that's roosevelt island and as you can see this was before the new building was built we could still see the highway and i think that we have the other part of the lab which is a ah, coffee machine the most important thing fuels us this is the letter for my boss from bill clinton when he got a Nobel Prize. I mean, not Bill Clinton, but my boss. So Bill Clinton congratulated him. And this is the other part of the lab. I also have to say that um, this is not a typical lab because it's usually uh, biology labs are, life sciences labs are usually smaller. Um, at the peak of, of the uh, lab, before Paul passed away, um, we had about 50 people. Um, and now it's dwindled to, I don't know, maybe 15. Aha, this is a sucrose preference test tubes. This is my experiment from a while ago. We still do that same type of experiment. Um, I'll talk about that shortly. And this used to be my desk and you don't care about this anymore because this was again for the kids and this is it. Th that's how the lab uh, looks like. And then I also have few images of the things that didn't make it to the movie. 
Um, this is the cold room. This is incredibly important for every lab to, I mean, not necessarily cold room, but we have a cold space where you can keep uh, reagents and um, do experiments that need a uh, cold temperature. Uh, this is how it looks like inside. This is where we keep um, different reagents usually for cell culture, but others too. And this door, this is not very common, but I was always amazed by it. This is actually the freezer and it's a room freezer where the temperature is minus 20. I really liked it a lot. Um, this is the place where I like to go in the summer <laughs> when it's really oh, hot. Um, the first place that I visit in the morning. Uh, this is the electrophysiology rig. Uh, where uh, electrophysiologists can trace the um, uh, signals um, in one neuron. Um, and this is actually not, it's very common and it's very much in use still, but there are much newer techniques that can trace um, activity of many neurons at one time. And these machines look a little bit uh, different. We used to have two electrophysiologists, so that's another um, electrophysiology rig. Um, and this is yet another room. This uh, here is cryostat where we cut uh, frozen brains and then do uh, either um, immunocytochemistry or in situ to detect different proteins and RNAs in uh, uh, brain tissue. Um, this machine is actually really cool. Um, you can isolate uh, uh, fluid from the brain um, and then detect different type of um, ions uh, using this machine. And not only ions, but also different neurotransmitters. It's microdialysis. Uh, machine. And uh, this is confocal microscope. Um, the confocal microscope can uh, detect different fluorescent uh, light. And I think you can detect as many as like six, eight at one time. Uh, we usually do not more than four, which means that on one brain section, you can detect multiple proteins if you use the antibodies that are uh, tagged with different fluorescent uh, colors. And you can do four or more um, at one time. So we use all these machines to study the brain and the lab uh, studies three different diseases, uh, depression, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's disease. And uh, when I joined the lab, um, I was actually kind of pushed uh, politely towards the Alzheimer's disease. And I was thinking to myself, oh my God, it's like you have to wait for a, a year, year and a half uh, for a thing to finish and you can actually do your experiment. And that was too long. I was too impatient. And I said, I'm gonna do uh, mood disorders <laughs> because it's a much quicker result. And um, I am actually now having uh, a really big project on Alzheimer's disease and it's very interesting. But for a while I've been studying uh, depression and the way that we approach that is that we always uh, either go top to uh, bottom or bottom to top. And the bottom here being genes and the top uh, the uh, behavior. So there were a lot of questions here um, about why we cho uh, have chosen the mouse as a model. Well, um, Anna, are yes. you done? Are you done sharing your screen? Oh yes. Yeah. Sorry. Just so yes, we can see that's you better. Correct. Thank you. I should have uh, stop share. Ha. Huh. Okay. For now, maybe if we have time, I'll show um, uh, like one or two more movies, but only if we have time. So, um, so a lot of questions were about mice and how um, similar are they to people and 
why did we choose mice? Um, a lot of it has to do with being practical, right? Um, yes, I understand the mouse. Remember the thing that I sent you, the little, the little images? And the mouse brain looks really smooth and it's way smaller than the human brain. But I have to tell you that everything that human brain has, or let's say majority of things that human brain has, um, a mouse brain has too. It's just packed in much smaller space. Uh, the cells are smaller, the brain regions are smaller, but basic circuitry and uh, how neurons look like and how they are connected together is basically the same. Also, the mechanism of how the nerve impulse uh, is generated, it's also the same. The speed might be different, the um, external stimuli, the response to environment might be slightly different, but in general, all of that is more or less the same. So that's why it is perfectly fine to study all sorts of different diseases on mice first. And then if um, you found a different drug therapy target or a different system or a gene, that is responsible for a disease, you can actually scale it up to uh, either bigger animals, which we don't really do that much anymore, or uh, do uh, clinical studies on people. Um, and there is also a few other uh, things about mice. First, they uh, reproduce very fast and they develop very fast. So the mouse is so-called adult or rather young adult at six weeks. And that makes it very fast in terms of um, getting more mice and getting uh, the results, the end result that you are looking for. And uh, they're also small, meaning they're cheap to uh, maintain in the lab. They don't need a lot of space. They don't need a lot of food. And uh, people who are still working uh, uh, on monkeys always say that it's much better to study monkeys. But I, I personally would not be able to do any experiments on monkeys because they're such amazing animals. And they remind me so much of little kids. We actually have a person at Rockefeller who works on monkeys and we can see them in the animal facility and they're so much fun <laughs> i don't know they they when you pass by the door they look at you and they try to um i don't know they they make some chirping sound it almost uh, sounds like a bird chirping and they, they're really cute so i wouldn't be able to do anything on monkey is. And uh, the, the, I think that there is also a law now that uh, forbid use of, let's say, chimps for uh, uh, animal research, unless I think in some special okay, or circumstances such as COVID, uh, because I think that they tested the first vaccines on chimps, although I'm not 100% sure. But for that reason, you can still use chimps, which are 98% um, overlap, gene overlap with people. So they are incredibly similar to us. Uh, but other than that, I don't really think that um, a lot of neuroscience is done on monkeys, at least not neuroscience that um, I do. And uh, so there was also a question, uh, uh, to, 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 to. How do we approach uh, depression in mice? They, when you look at them and their behavior, um, you can actually see that they uh, uh, ex uh, exhibit similar behavior to us. It's just that they can talk, right? Uh, but if they are anxious, you can clearly see that they are anxious. If they are withdrawn, you can clearly see that they are withdrawn. If they are scared, you can clearly see that they are scared, uh, but this is science, right? So we have to measure everything. So there are a lot of behavioral tests that are um, uh, designed to 
measure um, a certain behavior. So for depression, you know probably from, I don't know, just reading newspapers, there are that many different types of uh, symptoms and each person doesn't have all of the symptoms. Same uh, is with mice and somebody asked me if there was something uh, very interesting that I found. So for me, the very interesting thing that I found studying depression was that you actually have mice who are naturally depressed. Um, so when we get, let's say, 40 mice and you do a behavioral test, which is called social interaction, uh, mice are actually social animals. So they like to interact with each other and they like to, it's same as with dogs. When they see um, a known dog on the street, they immediately run to it and they sniff around each other and so on. So the mice do the same. And you have this test where you test the mice with uh, unknown, possibly aggressive mice, because they are way bigger than the mouse that we are testing. If they sniff around, and uh, the mouse is uh, also uh, in like a cage, so that it can't attack the other mouse. If the mouse that we are testing um, is spending a lot of time around that uh, unknown mouse, we uh, say that that's a normal behavior because that's what they usually do. Um, and that that mouse has a so normal social interaction. However, you see mice that are really super shy and don't spend any time around the other mouse. So we um, always call them uh, socially withdrawn, which is one of the symptoms of depression. Uh, Tracy, what do you think? Can I show them the, uh, do we have time for me to show them the actual test? I have a movie. Yes? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We have until about 10 o'clock. So share screen again. This is a PowerPoint, <laughs> actually. It's okay. Uh, finally, I ended up on PowerPoint again. I just also want to make sure that there's some time for students to actually uh, share questions. Uh-huh. Okay, so this is control mouse, so-called normal. And then look at them. The, the uh, uh, unknown mouse is here in this tube. Look how different they are. This one goes in the corner and just sits there. Oops. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. Uh, I did something strange. And um, so this is one of the tests that we use to um, detect uh, depressive mice. You got the point. And then the mouse sat there for another 10 minutes. Um, so um, we then look at the genes in different cells and uh, try to figure out how each gene uh, that we find interesting using bioinformatics methods. Uh, we um, uh, try to change the expression of that gene and see how that um, affects behavior again. So we go again to the uh, uh, behavior of the whole animal. And what we uh, found was that, um, I mean, not only us, but other people too, that um, depression actually is uh, something called polygenic disease. So there is not one gene that determines uh, depression. There is not one gene that uh, drives the Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. There are many genes and that's why it's incredibly hard to A, find the reason of why we develop these diseases and B, to find a really successful therapy that can help uh, very fast. And for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, we still didn't find any therapy. So we are really trying our best to uh, work on that. And um, 
I don't know, do you have any questions? Because I think that I'm kind of done with the project. Um, I don't want to go to too much details because I don't think that this is the place and time for it. So do you have any um, other questions? Um, I'm looking at your e your questions right now and see if I all answered. Um, how do you measure brain activity? Um, so as I said, brain activity can be measured different ways, both by gene expression, but also we can do the, the rig thing, the electrophysiology that I um, showed you. We have a hand up from Zoe. So Zoe, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and go ahead and, and uh, ask your question. Yeah, um, so you were talking about how like you had the depressed mice, but how do you make sure that the mice that you get and the mice that like reproduce and make more mice are actually depressed? Like how do you control for the fact that they might not exhibit that specific gene? Okay, um, so that's the thing that I didn't mention. Uh, it's an excellent question because it put me back to my, um, the beginning of the research. We actually modeled depression. There are two ways to do this, or actually three ways to do it. Uh, one way is to search for mice that exhibit depression naturally and then just inbreed them over several generations with other mice that also show depressive phenotype. And that way you get actually an inbred strain which exhibits some signs of some symptoms of depression. Uh, we don't do that in the lab. Uh, we do uh, two different approaches. One is to uh, make a transgenic mouse, which um, has uh, genes that are changed. And we already know that this gene affects depression. So we change the gene um, and make a transgenic mouse. And that's called either knockout or knock-in mice. So they are genetic models, but it's only one gene that is um, changed. And then the third thing, which is what I do, is we model depression. There are definitely many different types of uh, models uh, for depression. We usually expose so-called normal wild type mice to some harsh things. And that's why I'm not gonna show you any movies. Um, such as social defeat, where uh, one aggressive mouse um, attacks another mouse. And um, we repeat that day after day for 10 days uh, for about a few minutes each day. And um, finally, the mice become uh, pretty depressed. There is also something called restraint stress, where you put them in a really small tube so they can't move. Um, there is a social isolation test where you uh, keep mice one per cage. As I said, they're social animals, so they, they um, like to be with other mice and being alone in the cage makes them incredibly depressed. So this is how we uh, 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 take these mice then and study their gene expression. So we actually really do know <laughs> and confirmed by um, tests that we are working on a depressive mouse. And then we also have a control group, uh, which are just normal wild type mice that were not exposed to this um, harsh environment. And we compare them uh, between each other, doing all sorts of different tests. Um, does that answer your question? Um, okay, so uh, somebody actually asked if we are uh, ready to go from a mouse brain to a human brain as a next step um, in my project. Uh, unfortunately, I am not. Uh, although in my project, I found that statins, which are usually taken for um, cholesterol, 
actually have a really pretty good effect on uh, one specific gene and what it does in the brain in terms of depression. So what I would like to do in the future is to study people who take statins um, and then um, uh, for either heart disease or cholesterol and see how uh, prevalent is depressive phenotype in these people and then uh, see that if maybe uh, a different dose of statins can be added to other antidepressants to help people who um, have depression, especially if it's connected to a uh, stressful life. So that was kind of in another interesting thing that came out of my study. I can't publish that obviously because I don't have any people's data, but I think that would be a nice next step to actually really work towards um, helping people with depression. Um, okay, there are some other really interesting questions about um, not really connected to my research, uh, but more, more of uh, the life I've chosen. Why did I choose to be neuroscientist? And do I have any advice? So maybe I should answer and talk a little bit about that, right? So um, I basically never did anything else but neuroscience. I, uh, except my undergrad. My undergrad was molecular biology and only one part, like maybe one course was neuroscience. And it was actually not my favorite course by all means. I didn't like the professor either, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, after I finished college, I wanted to go to graduate school immediately. And the only uh, place where they actually, what they, they had immediate opening was the neuroscience program. And I said, well, why not? I can give it a try. And slowly over, let's say like two years, um, I got into it and then really fell in love with it. So it was not the love on first sight. And this is my, um, I think, best advice for anybody, try different things. If you don't like something, uh, but you think that there is a nice um, opportunity for you, um, just stick around a little while longer and see if you like it. Don't just drop things immediately if you don't like it. In terms of science, obviously, I can't talk about other um, other professions. And then um, the other thing that is also incredibly important in science is that you don't uh, get results fast. I mean, it's very rarely that things work from the first go. And you have to just kind of be incredibly patient. And um, I think the endurance and perseverance are incredibly important for the scientist. And one of my advisors also told me that to be a good scientist, you need um, actually uh, to deal with back seats pretty well. And because there are a lot of them um, along the line. But then the reward when things actually work, when you find, um, when you get good results are so rewarding. And so it makes you so happy that it's actually worth doing it. And um, in terms of neuroscience, I think it's actually really, really nice field to go to because there are so many different things and you don't actually, have to study um, only the brain. There are other parts of neurosciences that are um, incredibly important, such as um, spine, spinal cord injury, and um, I don't know, even heart disease and uh, gut is incredibly a uh, hot topic right now because all of them need um, brain and nerve cells to function properly. So that connection between the heart and the gut with the brain um, is not necessarily um, hardcore neuroscience, but also incredibly um, important and interesting field. Um, brain, uh, the uh, cancer, uh, cancers of the brain are pretty devastating. And a lot of them, with one exception of medulloblastoma, 
are pretty deadly and they are not easily treated. So that's another um, really interesting uh, field to go to. And then there is always basic science um, that uh, you can uh, work on. So I think that there is a lot of potential in neuroscience field, uh, also connection with psychology, with economics, but that's actually not my cup of tea because I really never did any of that. And um, I find it difficult to read these papers because I don't understand uh, the fine point. I understand the abstract. And then after that, not so much, maybe the first um, paragraph of the introduction, but other than that, summary is the only thing that I understand. But that's actually really kind of cool field too. And there was a um, person, Siddiq, that asked me about something very specific. So um, this is why I like to do these kind of presentations because all your questions uh, force me to actually rethink why am I doing things. Um, so he asked, uh, or she, I am sorry, I actually, I'm not sure if it's a she or he. What is, what do I think about Neuralink? Um, I have to admit, I didn't know what that is. <laughs> so I Googled it. And um, I actually, the, the um, therapy itself, it's uh, known for a really long time. This is, I think, just the company that does it. Uh, one of the companies that does it. Um, uh, it's the, you put the electrodes in different brain regions, and uh, by activating these electrodes, uh, you can actually uh, turn on and off and manipulate things um, around the house that I guess have some sort of Wi-Fi connection. So you think about turning on the light, and the light turns on. And I honestly, it gave me creeps because it sounded like a, a science fiction movie. And I immediately could see all sorts of bad things that can happen with it. But on the other hand, um, it's been done for Parkinson's disease and uh, uh, treatment resistant depression for quite a while now uh, they put the little electrodes in uh, for depression area 25 broadman area 25 which is somewhere here deep down and then for the parkinson's disease in substantia nigra which is somewhere here deep down um, uh, to basically um, activate that area because the activity of neurons itself is not adequate to help people a overcome their depressive that their uh, depressive phase and for parkinson's to actually move and uh apparently it works i mean for parkinson's i saw the movies it's amazing when you turn on the uh, the electrode in the brain the person who could not who, who had the who was really rigid and could not move at all, all of a sudden starts talking and moving. And it's amazing what it can do. So I think that in that sense, Neuralink is actually really good, but it would be, uh, and it is uh, really great for a very limited type of uh, disease, such as Parkinson's disease, maybe depression, it would not probably be able to help people with multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's. It would be actually great for people who have spinal cord injury. So for example, people who are paraplegic and cannot move, I think that it would be absolutely great for them because it would allow them to move again. Uh, can you imagine that? It would be amazing. So I am all for it, but on the other hand, I'm a little uneasy because just i don't know thinking about if you want to i don't know hurt somebody or turn on something that you should not and you are actually able doing that with a little electrode in your brain gives me creeps i don't know what do you think you can maybe discuss that with tracy later it's um, another topic it's ethics in science um, and I think everybody has to have that kind of 
really frank talk at all different times in your uh, learning experience in school, in college, in graduate school. I think that we need more ethic classes. So we actually know what we are doing and why. Um, okay, Do, does anybody, did I answer all of your questions more or less? Um, something really, what is the most challenging part of my research? Um, writing a paper, <laughs> which is what I'm doing right now. Um, you really need to know to actually write well. So for all you budding scientists there, don't discard your lit literature classes and uh, reading books because and writing because you are going to need that no matter what. If you are choose science and you go to work in any kind of science, you do need to actually compose your thoughts and to be able to put that on the paper um, successfully. So other people um, are really eager to read it and, and understand what's the message that you are trying to convey. So for me, that's, uh, that's hard, not only because English is my second language, but I think that I have difficulties writing in Serbian too. Um, so that's hard. And the other hard thing is when things not uh, don't work. Then you have to troubleshoot to figure out why are they not working to actually maybe even because you if you are getting if you are not getting a result that's bad. But if you are getting a different result, you don't then what you expected, um, you really have to kind of switch very fast and have a different overview because you need to explain why you did you why did you get a different result so you have to switch back and forth between you can't basically rely on the thing on your hypothesis as set in stone you have to be flexible um so that's also not always easy um and oh i like this question was there ever a time when you got stuck and had to start all over again? Man, <laughs> so many times. <laughs> and don't don't be, I don't know. I think that it happens to everybody and uh, not only in science, but in other professions too. You just have to be very um, persistent. And uh, in my, what, 30 years of, uh, science research i changed fields i mean it was always neuroscience but i changed topics several times and um actually most of the time was because i kind of thought that the new field would be um very interesting to study and to learn something new so so that that that's that's it just Continue.